Hello and welcome to Simplified. We continue our chat this week with economics professor Ashish Kulkarni, who is also a blogger at Econ for Everybody. We delve deeper into concepts of economics, how they impact our lives in ways we see and we don't. And we also ask him about the upcoming recession, the indicators of it, and how do we cope with it in our own personal capacities. The intersection of economics and philosophy. So philosophy is many things, right? It's making sense of the world right. at large, right? And your human condition, what life means, what... And economics in slightly more meta sense. Like, for example, I was reading recently about people who believe that growth is not important. Uh, equality is right? right so they would rather not have growth and have more income uh, equality and there's another point which shows or tries to show that growth even if it does increase economic inequality income inequality it actually improves outcomes for even the poorest people so you would rather be a very very poor people in a rich country than a not so poor person in a poor country because overall that kind of thing so then that starts affecting the way you think about life as a you know as a whole so what is your sense of how economics or what you see what you experience economics changes your view of the world or you know the way or your view on life or your view on the purpose of life or whatever big questions uh, philosophy includes so my favorite definition of economics is it is a study of how to get the most out of life and what economics will tell you is what are the tools that will help you get the most out of life but what is for you the most out of life, that can't come from economics. That must come from philosophy. Brilliant. Correct. So you can, yeah. Yeah. And that nobody else can answer for you. That only comes yeah. from within and from figuring out what you want out of life. But now that you've decided, okay, this is what I want out of life. I want to make simplified the best podcast in the world. Then sure, mm. economics can help you in figuring out how to make that happen. Do you mean to imply we already aren't? Huh. <laughs> anyway. So go oh, on. You. No, no. Or pa, pa is what we should be saying. <laughs> so, ah, exactly. So do you feel then, Ashish, a big yeah. part, and again, this kind of goes back to the problem with today's pedagogy again, is hmm. do you feel a large part of the problem today is not teaching that second part, that also vital, what do you want out of life thing? You're equipped, like arguably... No education system is equipping you with the tools better. It's just that you have this huge bunch of tools and you don't know what to kind of do with them. Would you think that that's a problem, not just for economics education, but overall in India? And promise, that'll be the last education question. Including for myself, this applies equally to myself. Uh, I don't think we ask often enough to ourselves, what is it that we want out of life? We simply take a look at what other people are running behind and say, chalo, this is what... Yeah, uh, sadly, the, sadly, the only time that that question is ever asked is during MBA interviews, where everybody gives the same answer. <laughs> <laughs> where do you see yourself five years from now? Where do you see yourself? Uh, years from? <laughs> yeah, but sure, but absolutely. I, I don't think hmm. all of us ask ourselves that question often enough. Yeah. I'd like to sort of, I don't know if I mentioned this on this podcast uh, before. There's this book I read a few months ago called Wanted by a guy named Luke Burgess. So this Wanted is about a topic called mimetics. And oh, yeah. Is, yeah, it's very interesting. So it's very simple also. And the funda is that you have uh, intrinsic desires and you have desires which are imitative. And a lot of us aren't able to make the distinction between the two. And we get trapped into having imitative desires which give us a lot of stress and don't give us the satisfaction when those desires are actually fulfilled. Whereas intrinsic desires, things which you really want to do and it's a good lens to look at things like that and that sort of somehow in my mind devolves into behavioral economics as well which uh, tells so there's this very nice sort of anecdote in thinking fast and slow about how a statistician a friend of Kahneman's falls for a bias even though he is the guy who actually discovered that bias. So it is how we are hardwired into, you know, having things like that. And that's why the new age of economics seems to be the behavioral uh, part where humans are essentially not rational creatures, which uh, was, uh, you know, assumed. That was a core assumption in the economic theory of yesterday. What are your views on, so it's very empirical, People do a lot of uh, very clever experiments, but Mm. economics being economics, a lot of those experiments are very difficult to 
you know, parse. You could right. twiddle the knobs of that experiment a little bit and get entirely new. Right. So how does one deal with things like biases, things like one's own irrationality? Does, in your experience, knowing more about something, you know, improve your resistance or sort of, you know, your tendency not to fall into that trap? How do you look at this whole subject? I would like to say that knowing more helps you avoid those mistakes. And I would love to be able to say that. But I end up having wondering too many. For example, if friends come over, I'll end up wasting a little bit too much time. The only thing that economics does is it, if the, when the moment of regret eventually occurs, at least you know where you screwed up. That's, a, that's the only <laughs> very, thing that economics does. Very, very nice way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is yeah, actually looking, half the... Yeah. It doesn't mean you're not going to screw up in the same way again. But yeah, you yeah, know yeah, you yeah. screw up for that reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, in some ways, that's taking an analogy of just taking like the extending that particular thing, right? I mean, it's, I won't say it's like based on a theory, but it's economics led thinking in some way where I'm like, I have like a specific, like Chuck is solidly into at least the last year I spent a significant amount of time working out and like building his fitness in some way. I have just, I have... Uh, neglected that aspect but the one aspect that I really look at is in some ways where I'm like when I'm looking at something eating something sweet or Mm. looking at something like that right I'm like there is a particular some mom's friend has got some mithai and stuff like that it comes in the house and all that stuff and she's like ha ye le le and I'm like Mm. No, I'm saving my calories for when I'm really tempted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I'm like, yeah, they go, I have, I know I shouldn't be eating this stuff. Eating garbage is not going to help me here because again, (laughs) I need, I, I know that I'm going to end up eating this. I will fall, I'll succumb to this, but I'd rather succumb to this on my own terms rather than succumbing to it in like some other concept. So I think I'd say economics led thinking has at least helped me. I mean, in some ways, ration my mistakes. (laughs) <laughs> so I am able to do them better while I continue to do them but just do them better I guess <laughs> no that's no, right said, well said yeah, yeah. I know I think mm-hmm. this is very interesting thinking and especially you're saying it at an interesting time right it's the beginning of the year everyone has mm-hmm. resolutions and everyone's trying to learn about habits and things like that and over the last few years this is renewed emphasis on building habits rather than that yeah. one outsized goals right if you I mean you've probably read an article if not the entire book by James Clear uh, on habits, the topic yeah. atomic habits so it's a brilliant book I think And what I find fascinating is the little thing that Shriket just spoke about. I see that kind of advice being said more and more, you know, like take the measurable things and, you know, kind of, it's almost like break your life down into small numbers so that your decision to do things becomes easier. So I'll take what Shriket said and extend it a little more. One fascinating way of thinking about junk food and, you know, rewarding yourself and all that is to think about calories, not from a daily basis, but a weekly basis. Right. And to aggregate your saved calories through the uh, through the week and completely splurge on that at the end. And you can do that guilty free, knowing that you're still well within your limit or, you know, whatever the case may be. And I see that possibly happening in other places. as Well, James, if you want to build a reading habit, start with, OK, today I will commit to reading 10 pages, for instance. Yeah. So I find this breaking down of, you say, vague goals into these tangible little things. One way of. I guess thinking about, uh, I, I don't know whether you would call that economic theory, but I find it it's quite interesting when you break it down into actual tangible numbers that you can quantify, maybe check off or something like that. Again, yeah. just an observation, not a question. No, absolutely. So my favorite blog to read about economics is a blog called Marginal Revolution. And there are oh, multiple okay. interpretations to the phrase marginal revolution. Yeah. <laughs> what you spoke about is a classic example of a marginal mm-hmm. revolution. Ki, yaar, aaj das panne <laughs> if you do that for a week, if you show up and read those 10 pages for a week, then over time, it ends up becoming a habit. So when I started writing on the blog, I started the blog uh, in 2016 and wrote fairly regularly for about a year. And then I gave up, which I think everybody is very good at doing. And then a couple of years later, I said, Chalo, I'm going to start. <laughs> Uh, writing the blog again but what I promised myself was every day I'll share five links that I read that day bus nothing more did that long enough I myself got bored with putting up only five links and then I said boss you know you should do something more and that basically is what you can call it atomic habits you can call it marginal revolutions but taking one step at a time and adding to that one step so long as you do that one step every day and go a very long way yeah absolutely 100 percent yeah the eight the some who was it who said the eighth wonder of the world is compound interest <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
True, absolutely. Yeah, so what I was mentioning was this entire thing about this aspect of doing it. And uh, similarly, another one, I think uh, there was another theory, which I, uh, I mean, for working out and all that stuff, there are all these like different hacks. One of the one of the ones that I saw, which was very simple, which said that it basically working out principle is like no second day off, right? Mm. The, the whole point is like between workouts, it's okay to take a day off right after the day you work out. Just make sure you don't take two days off back to back, right? Mm. And that's an entire aspect of like kind of behavioral hacking by understanding economic principles and understanding how like people function in certain ways and what are like those motivators for them like one aspect which i used and more venturing into behavioral science and that's actually a question which i'd want to pose later about where behavioral science ends and where behavioral economics begins in some ways but there was this one aspect which we were talking about was cholesterol so i was working on this Mm -hmm. one brief in malaysia where basically in malaysia a whole bunch of like uh, half the population has high cholesterol right and people generally try to like they bury their heads in the sand about the problem because they're like if you don't think about it it'll go away therefore the conventional way of thinking about it was let's hammer people by telling them that one in two malaysians have high cholesterol and that would turn people away even more like yeah. nobody wants to think about it and you're trying to push this scary fact in my face and so like we use this one principle called chunking and we kind of showed how people is like managing cholesterol is a very small task all you need to do is like really tiny interventions every day right you all you need to do is just do one thing here just do this one particular thing there go to the aisle and this pick up this one thing at this point of time so it's breaking up the task into smaller pieces help people kind of feel like oh it's not that big a deal right and so that helped in kind of understanding it so I mean, coming back to that question that I kind of asked about that was, I mean, there's a lot of understanding and there's a lot of interest in the space of behavioral science, right? And Mm -hmm. I'll admit, even though being a behavioral science enthusiast, I don't really very well understand the difference between how behavioral science works and behavioral economics works and where the line for one ends and the other begins. So I don't know if you will be able to enlighten us on that as such. Don't have the faintest idea, but I would say application of economic principles to behavioral norms is behavioral economics. But I don't know whether line stops. I would argue everything that we've spoken about can be thought of from a behavioral economics perspective also. But another underlying principle is that of incentives, which is just a whole fascinating story in its own right. How do you incentivize yourself to get something done? So Tim Ferriss, for example, has this way to incentivize himself to lose weight. He spoke about this many years ago, where he'll send a friend a truly embarrassing picture of himself in the most embarrassing pair of underpants that he possesses. And he'll say, if I don't hit my target weight by a particular day, I allow you to put this picture on social media. That's, in our language, we'll call that a negative incentive. And a positive incentive might be to reward yourself. That if you can stick to a particular thing, then you will reward yourself with something at the end of the day. But no matter what you do, the (laughs) usage of incentives is fantastic. Fantastic. Where behavior starts is where people figure out how to game these incentives. And we have a very cool, uh, I mean, only a nerd like me can think that what I'm about to say is cool. But we have a very cool way of expressing the fact that people like to game incentives. It's called Goodhart's Law. And what it says is every measure that becomes a target stops being a measure. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. We, the two of us have worked in digital marketing. We know exactly yeah. what you mean. <laughs> if there is a metric, it will be gamed. And that's a problem. I mean, Chuck, remember PTAT? <laughs> Small anecdote on this. So one of my early clients when I was started freelancing was a, a photographer. And um, uh, so I come from a school of thought where, where when it comes to digital marketing of saying, hey, the number of followers and all that, you know, doesn't matter and all that. Stop chasing that as a number because then right. that's what you're optimizing for rather right. than creating good content, etc. Right. So that's a, this is the, the idealistic school of thought that I come from. So mm-hmm. I ran into this uh, a photographer who was asking me again, based in the US, is like, okay, Deepak, how do I increase the number of followers that I have. I'm targeting all folks in India so that I can uh, increase that number on the cheap because the CPM rates over here are cheaper than in the US. And I said, and I'm like, <coughs> excuse me, now you don't really need to do this because I, I, I said this entire thing, right? Uh, acting like a guru. And then I understood his incentives, which was, I know all this, but when I go to galleries to publish my work, they look at the number of social media following that you have, and they don't give a rat's ass about whether these are Indians or people who are going to buy your expensive photographs or whatever. I just need to pump up that number. So I don't know if that's an example of this, but it just got me thinking about the whole angle of uh, incentives. And, you know, I think that's another thing that should be taught at a young age, which is the empathy to figure out the incentives, especially when you're being sold to or in a, any two-way transaction. Anyway, so that is just a small little aside. Just as an addition to this and something that I was 
working with i think uh, chuck you and i so chuck and i used to work together at an agency for a brief period of time and one of the accounts that we both shared was uh, this this particular client was really adamant so comes to me really adamantly and says hey i need to increase my follower count for this this stuff and all and i think the two of us worked together to kind of build this entire presentation to show why follower count doesn't matter the client nodded along agreed everything is fine i i continued working on it for a long time afterwards like this mission to educate kind of thing kind of like did a deep dive into it and the client still always skeptical then one day we finally sat down and as most things get resolved over a drink mm-hmm. and we kind of sat down over a drink and i just talked to him and i was like why are you still i mean we have spent this much time and you're not a dumb guy you spent so much time understanding why are you still insistent on this he's like you don't understand once i cross say 2 lakh followers i get to release a press release which puts out there that i have so many followers on social media that press release is part of my kra right so please don't i mean i understand where your concern is coming from and all that as a brand manager i can never in a formalized way tell you that yeah you're wrong but here is my concern i need a press release so just give me the number that i'm asking for don't uh, don't ask me further questions beyond that so it's again everyone is driven by metrics in a large way in like a corporate way, uh, sense and everyone's working towards delivering on those metrics so it's a classic thing right like i mean when i'm being chased by a bear i don't need to outrun the bear i just need to outrun you Correct. so <laughs> yeah so, so the uh, original story that, comes from hanoi where uh, there was a outbreak of plague and the government in hanoi said we will curtail the plague by rewarding citizens for having killed the rats and oh yeah 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 correct yes rats, yes you prove that you killed the rats by oh. bringing up a rat tail so people started <laughs> literally growing rats to cut off their tails and give it to the government <laughs> it's a classic example of how a measure stopped being a measure once it became the target and the way i like to explain this to students is to say your 75% attendance otherwise term not granted is basically the same thing at play you'll make sure you'll attend yeah. but there's no guarantee that you'll learn so you yeah. figure out how to learn. game yeah. the system but we are humans are very good at gamifying incentives in entirely the wrong way it's oh, always not yeah about. totally so i run a small uh, manufacturing business and uh, yes. i employ people and yeah. i have learned the hard way that you need to incentivize people i mean incentives are far more important than one imagines so yep. whatever your objectives are first you need to have clarity on what your objectives are and then you need to see very very carefully how to incentivize people and the world the real world and people are so complicated that almost invariably your first efforts are going to bomb so you will put some incentive and people will go game them yeah and it's an ongoing battle it's marketing for example for us we need to you know link marketing to sales mm. because it's institutional we supply to automotive companies so you know you get an order from an automotive company so you've told someone that he is in charge of this company and if he generates more he goes out and generates unprofitable sales right and because that's his met and i don't think there is any cut and dried answer on how you can uh, sort of actually set or design incentives but is there anything any book or any sort of body of work that you might have read that talks about these kind of thing i think nudge theory is one of those uh, sort of goes there but uh, something sort something of. less esoteric than that yeah Um, Discover Your Inner Economist by Tyler Coven is a book basically okay. about figuring out how you can incentivize both yourselves and others, but also the pitfalls of how to think about what might go wrong. So the uh, technical term for what you just said, Narayan, in terms of designing incentives and getting them right, it's if you want to sound all academic, is uh, incentive compatibility design. So how to make sure that your workers and you both have the same? Going to use that in a party this week. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. But uh, so Tyler Cowen speaks about a couple of examples which I love to use to illustrate to people the power of getting your incentives right and also what might go wrong. So he speaks about, say, for example, imagine that I hate sitting in a dentist chair, which I think is all of us. So yeah. what if I say to the dentist that I'll give you an extra amount of money if you make sure that it does not end up being a painful experience for me? Is that mm. a good incentive or not? So, yeah, no, yeah, it's, it's probably tough. a bad incentive. It's a tough exactly. One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. So, so which part of yeah. yourself do you want to pander to? The guy who doesn't yeah. want to sit in the chair again, or the guy who doesn't want to feel pain at all? But mm. one way or the other, you're going to get your incentive wrong, and you need to figure out what you're going to prioritize. The other thing that I loved and I used it uh, in the case of my daughter was he says every time you go to a museum, let's face it, every now and then you're going to get bored. But you have to pay so you're going to look at every damn painting in every damn room. 
you know you are bored to death you know you want to leave but nahi ab sunk cost fallacy all over again you go to want to take a look at every single painting so he says why did you try and gamify it for yourself ask yourself this question if you could steal only one painting from each room to hang above your bed which painting would you choose so yeah. now it's not about having to look at That's all the different paintings. way of looking at it exactly yeah. so now suddenly incentives are flipped yeah. and now you are no longer bored and this work in the case of my daughter so we spent a very interesting couple of hours where she went through the museum saying he hey, dad we, maybe we should steal this painting only downside was we <laughs> made a couple of security guard very nervous but that's a price that you pay <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, 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 sorry go on go on go on yeah go on no no this this reminds me of Ch- this time when i i visited bombay i think chuck and uh, we discovered this very interesting unexpectedly interesting museum in the middle of bombay which is the uh, nehru center which has basically the entire history of india from like the uh, indus valley civilization yeah, all the yeah, way wow. all yeah. the way till independence yeah. and that's a beautiful museum it's a beautiful actually it's museum. very detailed yeah. and it's a, it's visual it's a visual treat and it's it's amazing by generally needs to go through that but it's exhaustive and we went there with like oh let's spend half an hour going through this stuff and that was so exhaustive that we were like towards the end we were like more than i mean more than and it was free because again we didn't really spend any money going uh, in there but more was oh my god there is so much content over here yet we did not allocate the time over here so we were like we yeah, we were like rushing through the exhibits because we were like acha apne ko aage jaane ka hai but yeah we are still like committed and pot committed yeah. in some way right Ashi, so that particular thing was there but sorry yeah chakki yeah, was saying Ashi, something have you seen this movie called in time by any chance mm. So it's a fascinating. Oh wow, that's a beautiful one. Yeah. So the movie, movie, etc. It's it's one of those movies where the honestly the concept is better than the actual Mm. movie itself. Much like uh, yesterday, where the movie was okay, but the con, but the concept of what would work up in a world without the Beatles, I think that was fascinating. So in this movie, uh, there is no concept of money. right uh, what instead people have is time so when you say time is money this movie takes it literally so what happens is whenever you I have think, it economic- sorry you were talking about this movie in bangalore i think I think I was. Yeah, yeah. I might have mentioned it yes. because we had just correct, Chuck correct, and I had correct. just discussed yeah, it. So, so, yeah, so very possibly, so ahead, possibly. No, I'll, so I'll just uh, I'll just reiterate what happened over there for anyone who might not have heard of it. So whenever you complete an economic transaction, including work at your office, you don't get paid money. You get paid in time. And how that happens is you. It's almost like your entire arm is NFC, and you just plug like, and your your balance, your bank. What is your bank balance gets. reflected on your arm and it's fascinating it's kind of fascinating right what happens is when you run out of time you die that's when you like almost die and while watching the movie it was kind of fascinating but on reflection i was like hey this is all is exactly the same as money if you replace the novelty of this movie is the fact that they okay they made us think that time is equal to money but if you take if you replace everything time in this movie with actual money nothing really changes the plot is the same the villains incentives are the same except the currency here is more seconds instead of dollars and cents and that movie made me really think that uh, you know time really is money in some sense i mean i just thought i mean one thing for yeah. sure is that take that thought a little further and just put it there is that I think a classic I think one of the biggest fallacies that economics can help us solve is how much we undervalue time yes oh, yeah yes. for yeah. money yeah. right like how much time how much value need we need to assign to time and how much like we classically go penny wise pound foolish in mm. terms of time is concerned like where we say that okay I'm willing to like the very simple aspect of like I am willing to go and stand for 3 hours in a line where I could get it done for 1 hour I mean one one aspect which i feel which is very relevant with at least our parents in some ways and i think it comes down over here is like my the other day my mother was she there was a some bank work was to be done or whatever and she had uh, paid the guy in advance she had paid him some money in advance some 200 bucks in advance right and then he kind of forgot about it and my mom has a bad knee so climbing up stairs and all that stuff is a pain for her She was like, but I paid him two hundred bucks in advance, and I'm like, bro, you climb up that set of stairs because there's no other way to get up there. You twist your ankle, knee, and it's going to cost us at least a couple of lakhs in therapy and everything else, right? But that two hundred rupees, by yeah. in principle, it's like causes so much rage that she had to climb those stairs and go and confront that manager to get whatever done. And that's where I think not just time, but also health in that way. Like we trade off on health and time because it feels like it's a 
we have enough of it and we have it's an expendable commodity over something that is money which is very quantifiably running out right so i think that's a very interesting concept but yeah for, moving from that and this is actually one question that i i really wanted to ask ashish and in fact i so i i met ashish a few weeks ago in bangalore and i distinctly held off from asking this question even though <laughs> so i really wanted to <laughs> because i was saving it for the podcast was generally i mean i mean i would love to hear what the economists outlook is on the upcoming so called upcoming recession kind of situation right now because i mean there is a lot of conversation about that now and in my this thing i'm i dabble in the markets a bit mm-hmm. and like from the markets point of view it's all there's a lot of speculation there's a lot of up and down the markets are on all time highs yet everyone is like oh i'm taking all money out of equities kind of mentality on some level then you talk about it from a more national point of view where everyone's like okay inflation is through the roof after covid the k shaped recovery happened and whatever else like different kinds of angles happened with all of that so there's a lot of a lot of murkiness mm-hmm. for the lay person in terms of what is going to happen whether there is a recession going to happen and whenever we say recession at least i would say millennials with the only recession we have experienced was 2009 which was like an explosive kind of recession right there was this one big event and then like the markets crashed and then there was a period where jobs weren't there and that was followed by a period of economic growth right and i'd say someone who has studied probably more recessions than the last one what is your perspective on the upcoming recession what it's coming with and like maybe some angles of how we can prepare for it take a quick break we're speaking with ashish kulkarni blogger at econ for everybody and economics professor see you on the other side stay tuned to simplify welcome back to simplify we're speaking with ashish kulkarni economics prof and blogger at econ for everybody Okay, so three responses. First, I don't have the faintest idea. <laughs> yeah, excellent. <laughs> no, I, I mean that quite you, seriously. You would be on another podcast if not simplified. If you actually do the answer, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's yeah, that that's true. <laughs> the, yeah, yeah. No, but the whole point is again, I'm not asking your understanding of knowing how it is, but. how can yeah like you gave us the phrase what was that phrase you just said about educational incentivize educate no, sorry incentive, incentive management to something design. yes yeah. i need terms like that <laughs> <laughs> no, so we will we'll get to all of those terms but i i genuinely mean that anybody who claims to be able to predict the future they don't know what they're talking about if i did know how to predict the future trust me i wouldn't be recording a podcast right now i'd be trying to figure out how to game the market to make more money so that's yeah, one like that's like great. like the guy who bet in back to the future you remember he had the good oh, yeah, yeah, all yeah, the bets and he went back in time yeah, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was a brilliant optimization of time i thought if i were like <laughs> if i had time travel that is what i would do find who yeah. won bet it's a random idea actually i think you should there doesn't already exist you should rate movies by economic accuracy or what they should have done to maximize economic Ooh, output or brilliant. something like that what a bad idea yeah. content idea content, content idea, idea. <laughs> content idea. <laughs> superb yeah but so, yeah go on yeah. go on uh, the second thing is if anybody does claim to predict the future this is something that i learned by reading uh, skin in the game by talib but ask them mm-hmm. if they have adjusted their portfolio accordingly and if they haven't they just missing <laughs> yeah. yeah so i haven't adjusted my portfolio accordingly i don't yet know enough about what is going to happen in 2023 to be short on the market or to go long on the market or anything for that matter i'm just continuing to say whatever it is that i would in a normal course which is not me saying that there is not going to be a recession which is me saying i don't know if there's going to be a recession but having said both of these things this is a very long disclaimer now what you are speaking about how will we try and figure out what indications might there be that a recession is coming along first quite simply crowdsourcing the idea so a lot of uh, professional polls that have been conducted amongst economists usually the response rate by now has been in excess of 50% that more than half of economists are saying that yes there likely is to be a recession all of them could be wrong but there does seem to be some sort of a consensus gathering so that's one thing you might want to look out for at a very base mm-hmm. level even if you yourself don't know economics economics sorry what are the so called experts saying second interest right. rates are high right now and inflation is high right now and it is almost all but a guarantee that interest rates will be raised a little bit from here on in not just in india but the world over and what mm-hmm. that that means on the ground is a lot of one consumers are going to say it is now more difficult to buy homes it is more difficult to buy apartment it is more difficult to buy cars it is more difficult to buy flat screen tvs let's not buy all of this right now at the margin so people who might have mm-hmm. decided to buy something by taking a look at how low interest rates are are now not buying that stuff and so therefore there is now an incentive for people to not produce that stuff one yeah second even if you were planning on producing something you need to ask yourself am i better off keeping this money in the bank or am i better off employing it and building out a new factory the higher the interest mm. rate it is the more attractive it is for me to keep money in the bank right so one 
consumers are likely to not buy quite as much producers are not likely to spend quite as much and that is the very definition of a recession so in extremely mm. simplistic terms yes it is all but a guarantee that there is likely to be a slowdown right now sometime in the year 2023 compounding all of this is the fact that we have that mad war in russia sorry in ukraine going on right now that shows no sign of abating and that is only going to add to the inflationary pressures for the yeah. simple reason that both russia and ukraine tend to be really major exporters of basic crops those are simply not available mm. and food inflation is not going to therefore come down anytime soon fuel inflation is therefore not going to come down anytime soon we got lucky because europe has got a mild winter this year but in addition to all of what i said one high food prices be eventually whether you like it or not high fuel prices combined with high inflation combined with high interest rates it's just a perfect sorry the recipe for a perfect storm which is why very simplistically put yes there is all but likely to be a recession this year the question is the timing so i know broadly i'm fairly sure that the direction in which the economy is going can i time it i wish i could but i don't know exactly when the recession is going to happen that's a great answer in that way but what also comes down to is what is it going to look like like what does it how does it how do we know that we are going to be when are we when we are already in a recession and what is it what are those key indicators that are going to tell us that hey here we are finally this is where the recession has begun and these are where the things are going to go off like and this i know i understand again all the disclaimers in place yeah. uh, where we are saying that yeah again we what i guess you would be able to model it on is what recessions have behaved like in the past right so again on that what are those key markers and indicators knowing that there is a delta of the stuff that we don't know yeah so in the language of economics what you're asking for is what are the leading indicators and the reason i yeah. bring this up is because there are also what are known as lagging indicators you can take a look at how gdp has changed over time and you can say that if there has mm-hmm. been a decline in gdp for two successive quarters then you might want to declare it as a recession the problem with that mm-hmm. plan is we report our gdp two months after the quarter has ended so we'll only find out what yeah. is happening in this quarter two months after the quarter has gotten over and well, no pun intended but in terms of a quarter getting over that is going to be a <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah 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 nice no, no, subtle, subtle was, but nice <laughs> yeah this was also true of the game that going back to that fed chair game right yeah, like exactly. the stuff is that when whatever actions you take can only impact like a quarter or two after that you've taken exactly. those actions Correct. so there is that lag that happens in that as such so yeah you can't like have immediate results on things but yeah go on sorry you so were saying so real time indicators you might want to take a look at say for example particularly in india you might want to take a look at how two wheeler sales are doing and the reason i said two wheeler mm. sales is because four wheeler sales are actually not a good indicator of how well the indian economy is doing because mm. not many of us actually end up buying automobiles so very few right. literally a very few privileged people end up doing so but motorcycles almost everybody will at some point of time in their lives buy and unfortunately right. two wheeler sales in india have not been doing all that great and if you see a sign that they are declining even further from here on in that would be a pretty good indication that things are not looking so hunky dory you might want to take a look at real estate prices not necessarily only in the urban areas but especially in the rural areas that might provide another indicator the stock market i would say is actually not a good indicator because it is driven absolutely i think more by hype than anything else and you might want to take a look at simple indicators that really should begin to cause you worry say for example uh, do you see evidence of shrinkflation so hindustan unilever and how it is pricing its products and not just pricing its products but also how it is changing the quantity within each product yeah so shrinkflation mm. simply means i'll keep the price the same but sell you a slightly lesser quantity mm. Mm. so 10 rupees ka soap abhi bhi 10 rupees ka hi hoga but you will get a slightly smaller bar of soap and when mm. that happens you realize that a company like hul is struggling to get sales in rural areas and rather than cause a reduction in price they are reducing the quantity sold and the only reason they're doing that is because people are not even willing to buy at 10 rupees Absolutely. that is likely to be a good indicator that we have a recession upcoming yeah and 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 not just and and uh, this part is not just quantity but also i mean i used to work i used to work with leading chocolate brand mm. and the other aspect was they used to maintain their price point but also what they used to do was substitute i mean they increase the volume of sugar in the chocolate and reduce the volume of chocolate because yes. chocolate's far more expensive than sugar Correct. right so that that was one way of kind of mitigating it so even though they kept the volume the same quality effectively of the product kept changing so these are these are interesting markers to look out for yeah and uh, so uh, besides that like i mean i i'd look at it get these as macro indicators to kind of gauge where the overall economy is getting into a recession 
how does i mean what are those key aspects i mean which you would probably which you could probably tell that an average consumer an average non economics person who is living their everyday life can do to kind of like first identify the points of a recession and also what what they can look out for and what they can do to kind of like safeguard themselves or at least like safeguard their interests in any which way from a recessionary atmosphere during i mean before during and after a recession really more a question for a personal financial advisor than an economist and i'm not a personal financial advisor but yeah fairly that's simple fair. rules which i would think anybody should practice is boss even if you don't earn anything for the next 6 months do you have some liquid cash somewhere ki guzara chal jayega is mm-hmm. but you'd be surprised at the number of people who end up not doing something like this it doesn't have to be oh, yeah. the same kind of lifestyle but you should have the ability to make your home run for the next 6 months and this money isn't to be in equities it isn't to be in anything even remotely risky this is i don't know to use the word or phrase safe as houses after 2008 it should be kept as <laughs> it should be kept as safely as possible that goes with what saying number 1 number 2 and again this is fairly obvious stuff but i worry about the number of people i know who don't seem to follow this do not for the love of god max out your credit cards and always pay the full amount not minimum amount due i'm speaking to a very small portion of india's population who actually has credit cards but even outside of credit cards don't over leverage yourself in terms of debt if you know that a recession is coming along but it's interesting to me over time the indicator that i have relied upon the most is the number of times i'm asked when i teach economics in an mba college sir agle saal recession hone wala hai ya nahi is i found to be the best indicator of whether wow. there is going to be recession next year or not <laughs> because nobody is more interested in recessions than people are going to sit for placements agar wo log pooch rahe aur unke chehre pe tension hai to bas the economy is in trouble chuck is recession back relating over recession back 2009 mica thank you thank you thank Ouch. you yeah. <laughs> no, okay. yeah, so you know, uh, try to convince companies to come on campus right so when those uh, guys start asking you questions that's Pretty, a pretty good yeah, idea. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> I think that experience <laughs> taught me a lot, including how to live in Bombay on a budget. But anyway, we will not get into how we salvage that. But yeah, yeah, that's but a great. It's, it's the same it's point, Chakra. Yeah, what I said is a bad teacher teaching you how to be a good professor. A bad mm. placement season teaches you how to think wow. about your career. Yeah, yeah. I actually wouldn't <laughs> stop that. Very yeah. true. Very profound, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I actually sum up. I uh, round off this by like. an overall econ question and here is where i would also give you an opportunity to make your plugs if you so choose to as an as, as an average uh, lay person who is interested in economics but uh, doesn't really know where to start and doesn't really know where to like begin to get a better understanding of the space what are those resources that you would recommend and uh, mm. places that you can go to kind of like start off this journey sure so marginal revolutions university the same blog that i spoke of the two professors who run that blog have created an online video series which is entirely worth watching there are subtitles mm-hmm. available in almost all indian languages so feel free to follow along no matter which language you're most proficient with but marginal revolutions uh-huh. university is a good place to begin Everybody, and this is for like absolute beginners absolutely as beginners. well so you can begin principles right. of right. economics right. micro and macro and you need to know nothing they don't use a single equation in those videos it's entirely worth watching i am working with them on a part time basis oh, nice. so there is some bias involved but i genuinely do think that they are easily the best uh, resource that you can use in terms of video in terms of audio i can't better planet money it's fantastic everybody should listen to the planet and money podcast uh, and it's sister podcast the indicator as well which i think is a great yes. name for a show absolutely and in terms of books so rather than everybody recommends free economics but you might want to read a book called the undercover economist by a guy called oh. tim hafford yes i've heard of this mm-hmm. yes Yeah. yeah so he's also got I mean, he's got lots of books out but you might also want to read about 50 things that change the modern economy this is both a podcast yes. and a book but uh, the undercover economist and the undercover economist strikes back are both very good books oh, too oh very nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah both very good books uh, fantastic and sure i'll plug my own blog but i don't think you should read the blog to learn about economics you should read yeah. the blog to basically listen to me rant about everything about I think that's I think that's a great yeah. place to begin. And that is econ for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, that is econ. We'll put all these links. Yeah. So Shriket, I have a few yeah. questions for you which I have mm-hmm. assiduously yes, been so making me. <laughs> yeah for you. Okay. Uh, Ashish feel free to answer these as well if you get Narain has a look on his face he knows where this is going. So um, Oh god. What do you call a thermos that gets a man out of jail? I'm afraid to ask. 
Milton yes. Friedman, obviously. <laughs> of course. Uh, uh, okay. Now, if you were to hunt and eat a raw fish, you could say that the game is in the skin. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, this is what I was sitting and writing, huh, by the way. They're like, uh, how on earth is it possible for tasers to exist because of supply shock economics? No, supply shock. <laughs> Why? Okay. Oh my God. No, I'm, still, I'm still very much above the fold on this paper. You know, in uh, these, you're uh, going to scare off future experts. <laughs> you know, uh, or, or keep them coming back. Or keep them coming back. He tends to write them during the episodes. Awesome. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> so, uh, or awful, depending on your point of view. Yeah, you so you know are. these hisab kitab books, right? Which you have probably seen your uh, Kirana wala use. So mm-hmm. at the end of the day, he sits and adds. You know how much he has on the side, right? That is called marginal revenue. It's <laughs> kind of proud of that one, but Sri Ket wasn't. <laughs> okay, what do you call, you know, there are various kinds of markets, right? What do you call a kind mm-hmm. of market in which you sell only one small horse? And this you should definitely get. One of you should get. What, what is it? One trick you sell only? One trick. <laughs> No, not one trick pony. pony. One trick pony was a great answer, but I was actually going for monopony. You know, like monopsony. (laughs) Monop. So, anyway. Oh, instead of this beach, we could have gone to that one. And now we are wasting our time over here. This is an example of opportunity coast. Opportunity coast. Coast. Opportunity coast. Oh, ma. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so that was fantastic. I mean, Ashish, thank you so much for taking the time and like... Uh, this is great. Yeah, so thank you so much. And yes, please, uh, we will leave all of uh, where places where you can follow Ashish. Importantly, his blog, Econ for Everybody, which I feel is a delightful read. I mean, blogging is... Uh, is is a is a dying art form in some way, and I think Ashish is one of those few people who I still follow. No, man, on we, that. we I think we need to. I think one two things. Right, one I think we need to make blogs great again. I think. Uh, yeah, I think <laughs> that's one. And two, I am fully on board with anyone who puts a little bit of their personality and a little bit of mm. their story yeah. into the way they write. And my favorite current writers, whether it's, I don't know, somebody like a Scott Galloway or somebody who's like a Shruti Rajgopal and Amit Varma. I think all of these guys, they aren't just good at what they do and how they think, but also putting themselves out there. And I definitely see that happening. So thanks so much, Ashish, for appearing thank on the show you. and for all that you do. Super. So thank you so much. And Naren, do you want to sign us off? Yes. Stay safe, stay economical and stay simplified. 